A tutorial on the newton raphson power flow method, part four. This example comes from the Granger and Stevens's power system analysis book that is used across many universities all over the world. And uh, this is example 9.4 within this book. So you could look at the book for this example and, and follow along and learn about the newton raphson method. And this is uh, by no means going into the theory of the method, but this is more of understanding the newton raphson method by example. So in the previous parts, we kind of built up our case and we introduced the formulas and we introduced our Jacobian matrix and we plugged in our initial values uh, to determine the mismatch. We plugged in our initial values to determine the Jacobian matrix and then we calculated the delta x1 uh, and delta x2 for the zeroth iteration, plugging in our initial values, of course, uh, where we have to invert our Jacobian matrix to find out what these guys were. And then we, uh, we, we calculated the values for the second iteration, which are delta x1 and delta x2 for the second iteration, right? So now, in this part, we're going to go over the second iteration very quickly, so we solidify this example. Okay, so in the second iteration, we already know what delta x1 of 1 is, which is going to equal to negative 0 0.150, and delta x2 for the second iteration is, is equal to 0 0.925, okay? Now, let's first calculate our mismatch. So remember, our mismatch was simply delta G1. But now it's for the second iteration. That is equal to B1 minus H1 for the uh, second iteration. The values that we plug in are going to be different, right? So X1 is uh, this value here. X2 is this value there. And then, of course, u, we're going to set that to just equal 1. So the values that we plug in is negative 0 0.150 for x1, 0 0.925 for x2, and then just 1. Okay, so that is equal. Well, our b1 didn't change, right? b1 was uh, still equal to negative, um, it was, let's see, uh, right here, negative 0.60 so b1 was still equal to negative 0.60 and then b2 was equal to negative 0.30 and that didn't change so b1 is equal to negative 0.60 and then h1 was going to equal uh, 4u x2 sine of x1 and so this term go to 1 uh, x2, x2 is going to be a little bit different. Uh, x2 was this term right here. So that's going to equal 0 0.925. And then x1 is this term right there. So x1 is equal to negative 0 0.150. When you evaluate this via a calculator, uh, you have to remember that this term here that is a term in radians, right? It's not an angle, but it's in radians. So make sure that the calculator is set to radians. So that is gonna equal negative 0.60 minus, uh, and it'll turn out to be a negative value, 0 0.5529, okay? And that, my friends, um, is going to equal negative 0 0.047079. Now make sure you do this math to keep me honest, but so that sounds about right. So we're taking negative 0.6 and then we're adding 0.5529, yeah, that sounds about right. And this matches the book too, so we know that's right. So delta G2 for the second iteration that's going to equal, again, B1 minus H2. And then we're also going to put in our initial values, 5 and 1. That's going to equal, remember, B1 was negative 0 0.30 minus, now, H2. Now, we have to go back to it and figure out what that H2 term was, right? So, H2 is right there, 
So that's going to be 4x2 squared minus 4ux2 times cosine of x1 was 4x2 squared minus, I remember this parentheses there, minus uh, 4ux2 and then I think it was a cosine, the cosine of x1, yeah that sounds alright. So uh, again we have to put in our initial conditions x2 is this term right there and this is this term right there and this is u so x2 is 0 0.925 so we put in x2 there uh, u is just 1 x2 is 0.925 and x1 is negative 0 0.150 well it turns out that this my friends is equal to negative 0 0.23 595 when you evaluate it. Okay, great. So now we have delta G1 for the second iteration, and that's going to equal negative 0 0.047079. Delta G2 for the second iteration is going to equal negative 0.06405. So the next part is determining the uh, partial derivatives. So the partial derivative of dj1. Okay, so at this point here, I took a small break and when I came back and resumed, for some reason, the video did not get recorded. So I had gone through and marched through all this math and it wasn't recorded. So in this last part of the video, I'll just go through uh, the steps that I have done to complete the second iteration of this example. So in step one, in step one, we calculated the mismatch, delta G1 and delta G2, and we had these two values. Now in step two, um, we have to calculate our Jacobian matrix with the x1, the with the previous iterated x1, x2, and u values. Remember, in our previous iteration, x1, x2, and u, well, x1 was equal to negative 0.150, x2 was equal to 0.925, and u, we set that to simply equal 1. Now, we go through this iteration, and remember, this partial, partial differential equation this equation right here is equal to 4u times x2 times cosine of x1 and now we just enter in the iterative values in here where u is 1, x2 is 0.925 and x1 is negative 0.150 and we get this answer right there. Similarly for this partial differential equation we enter in, this in these initial values and then here is the partial differential equation right there. Once we enter in the initial values, it spits out that solution. Similarly, we do that same thing for this partial differential equation. It spits out that answer right there. And this partial differential equation, and that spits out this answer right there. So we go through all of our partial differential equations that define the Jacobian. And this is, for the first iteration, right? This is what we get. Now remember for j of 0, I believe it was pretty straightforward. It was 4, 0, 0, 4. But the next iteration, it got a little more complicated. And so to find delta x1 and delta xu, if you remember correctly, so that's step 3, calculate delta x's, if we remember correctly, we had to invert the Jacobian matrix and then multiply that by our mismatch. So this right here is our mismatch. And that should equal delta G1 of the first iteration and delta G2 of our first iteration, of course. So it's the it's the inverse of the Jacobian matrix times our mismatch and that'll equal delta x1 and delta x2. Now, to confirm that this is in fact uh, our mismatch, we go back over here. So here is where we calculated our mismatch. And sure enough, it is 
it is the same. So I did, in fact, copy it correctly. So once we evaluate that, we get delta x1 as this value there and delta x2 as this value there. So this is the change, right? This is the change in x1 and x2. Okay, now step four, so step four is to advance the iteration. So now x1 of the second iteration, now x1 of the second iteration, that's going to equal x1 of the first iteration plus the change in x1 of the first iteration. Remember, we said x1 was just negative 0 0.150, right? And the change in x1 is going to be this value here. The change in x1 is going to be that value there. And when you, um, when you subtract both of these values, we get negative 0.16635, which makes sense. Now, x2 for the second iteration, that's going to equal x2 of the first iteration plus the change in x2 of the first iteration, right? So the, the first iteration, x2 of the first iteration, that was 0 0.925 plus the change in x2 of the first iteration, that's what we calculated there. So that's gonna be entered there. So 0 0.925 plus minus 0 0.021214, that's gonna equal 0 0.903786. And so what we now have, let me clean this up a little bit. So what we now have is x1 and x2 for the second iteration. Now, to solve this problem, or the last step for step last five, step five, how do we know when to stop? How do we know at what point do we stop iterating our newton raphson method? Essentially, when we want to stop, the change in x1 and the change in x2 is very, very small. So as we're going through this iteration, we will find that the change in x1 and the change in x2 which are like these values there, they're gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we wanna stop iterating when these values, the change in x1 and the change in x2 is smaller than some threshold that we set. And in the book, it has set 10 to the negative five as that threshold. In the example, in the book, they had to go through four iterations. So x1 for in the fourth iteration, that in the book, uh, these are the values that they had given in the book. And once you reach that point, that right there is the solution. In the book, once you get through the end of this example, they allude this problem to an actual power system. Granted that it's a small power system, it's a, a tuba system, but this is the procedure that we use to calculate the power flow in a multi-bus system okay it's much more complicated than that but these are the steps that we use now to conclude this video if you haven't already please go ahead click on the bottom right corner of this screen and there's a button to subscribe go ahead and subscribe to this video if you found it useful and of course if you have any questions there will be a link to a forum where you could sign up and you can ask away about all sorts of questions. In part five, we're going to take a look in the power system that the book alluded to when they gave this particular example. So we'll relate these equations to actual values in the power system and see how they correlate. Thank you. This video was brought to you by GeneralPack.com, making power systems intuitive.